Okay, so let's dive down a little bit deeper into the menus. I think Panasonic have done a very good job here of creating a fairly streamlined menu that doesn't require a lot of nesting. Uh, again, most of the uh, features that we care about accessing are going to be right here on the home screen, which isn't even really in the main menu proper. Uh, so that's going to show us things like our current sensor FPS, what we have going on in our color system, I'm diving into that just a little bit. This is a vlog capable camera, so when you set your main color, you can choose whether you want to just record in Panasonic's log mode and do a lot of color grading afterwards, or if you would like to just create a scene file. Uh, so this is similar to painting a camera in a broadcast perspective, and it's much better for workflows where the turnaround needs to be very quick, uh, or maybe it's uh, even a live uh, workflow where it's not going to be possible to do any color grading. I think for most people, because this is a Super 35 cinema size sensor, you'll see uh, generally we'll use it in the vlog mode. And then when you're doing that, it's very helpful to be able to visualize something other than the actual log gamma. So Panasonic have allowed us to route, like I said, the SDI and the HDMI separately, as well as the, uh, the LCD. Now currently, so I can show you the menus, you are looking at the uh, LCD output on my monitor. Just one of the nice unique features of this camera is that those three pathways are independently routable uh, and, like I said, independently processed. Uh, in this particular setup, we are only given the option of looking at vlog or, as they put it, V709 or a 709 look for the camera. Uh, Panasonic don't currently have any plans to allow loading of any third-party LUTs uh, or looks into the camera body, so if you wanted to be able to visualize a creative look that's outside 709, you'd need an external monitor to do something like that. Panasonic has all of the standard uh, exposure settings that you would expect to see on a camera like this. Uh, you know, being able to view shutter in uh, degrees or speed, which is very helpful depending on the background that you come from, uh, and as well as giving you some quick access information here about time remaining in your battery and card, time code, and uh, audio meters, all right at a glance. Uh, now, astute viewers may notice that I've set the camera to a rather high ISO, and the reason for that is, uh, like the Vericam lineup, the EVA-1 has the dual native circuit uh, in their ISO. And for those unfamiliar with that feature, what that means is that Panasonic have done a really remarkable thing uh, with the ISO setting in that they've created a way for the camera to have two native ISOs. So they have one circuit at 800 and one circuit at 2500 ISO. So that is a little bit different. People familiar with the Vericams know that the circuits in that is 800 and 5000, uh, but they were able to push it to 2500 for this particular camera, which I think is no mean feat for uh, such a small, compact, and relatively inexpensive body. Uh, the long and the short of the dual circuit means that when using the camera set in its two native ISOs with the appropriate native circuit selected, you will get roughly the same noise response. Uh, so it's pretty special, I think, for a camera, especially designed for a compact run and gun workflow, to be able to have the same noise at 800 ISO that it does at 2500 ISO. Um, you can, of course, continue to adjust from there. Uh, so then it's often a matter of kind of splitting the difference or finding that happy medium. Uh, but again, because the camera has internal NDs, uh, it does a very good job of allowing you to kind of find the, the sweet spot in, in terms of that. Uh, we have some basic audio controls on the main page here, and then, of course, uh, white balance, just as we'd expect to find it. Diving a little deeper into the menus here, uh, in the system mode menu, we are looking at our kind of baseline settings for our project. Frequency would be similar to, in terminology to uh, project frame rate or a project time base. This is our playback speed and what the camera's primary recording is at. So if we choose to use the slow motion features, uh, this is the speed that's actually going to be written to the card based on uh, whatever we set our sensor FPS at. This is also where we select the sensor mode to determine whether we're going to use the full sensor width or one of the crops, uh, as I had mentioned before. Uh, and then the main codec once we've selected that. Uh, now note that this is all internal recording. This doesn't affect anything going out in terms of uh, what you would expect to see on an external recorder. So this is all going down to the SD cards, which is a pretty impressive feat in terms of resolution and frame rate options. We have a repeat of the color settings menu, so I'm not going to dive too deep into that as I showed you on the main page, but we can do that from the main menu as well. And then here's where we can configure our user settings. Uh, you can see with these switches, there's a lot of great options that we have here. Uh, I've left most of them on the defaults, but we have some other kind of cool and unique features uh, that are on here, such as the focus squares, uh, as Panasonic calls it. These are a very cool feature, I think, in terms of focus assist and pretty unique to the Panasonic uh, lineup. If you're not familiar with them, the idea is that the squares in the image enlarge as the camera sensor determines that that area is in focus. Now, of course, as with any assistance function, you have to take it with a grain of salt, as the machine can only be so intelligent in terms of guessing where it thinks uh, things should be in focus based on contrast. Uh, but that said, I think that this is kind of a unique way to look at it and uh, really quick to get uh, judgment on what's in good focus and what's not. 
In addition to that, Panasonic have added a digital level into the camera. Now, some other cameras have this feature, but I really like the Panasonic implementation here. As you can see in the corner of the screen, I've just got a little green bar graph, I guess you would call it, that gets better or worse depending on how level my camera is. So I'll show you there. You can see as it gets really a uh, Dutch, we get a very, very orange, very upset uh, bar graph, but as we return there, it returns to green to make us happy. That's really helpful, especially on a camera like this that has an externally mounted viewfinder that's not part of the camera body. That's very easy for those to get put off kilter in such a way that it's tough to tell exactly if your shot's level or not. So the digital level is a very helpful tool, and I'm excited to see that on this camera. Still within the system menu, there are a number of uh, just basically preferential adjustments allow you to lock the side of the camera. There's also a physical locking button on the body. So if you're in one of those situations where you're worried about the buttons getting hit by accident while you are recording, you can lock it out. Uh, there are a number of settings in terms of dimming LEDs and adjusting the fan noise. Uh, though, as I'm sure you'll notice, seeing as I'm standing right next to this with a mic on my shirt, it's a very quiet camera as it is. Uh, you can adjust the LCD brightness, system clock, and then add some other information, as well as change the language if you need to, and of course, reset the factory defaults. So drilling down a little further into the menus here, let's have a look at the camera settings menu. Uh, in the camera settings menu, we've got all of the same sort of adjustments that I showed you on the home screen, uh, like shutter, exposure index, white balance, uh, and some fine-tuned controls for those uh, that we wouldn't normally find on the home screen because they're not necessarily the sort of things that you need to access frequently. Uh, but this is also where we access the camera's slow motion capabilities with its variable frame rate. Now, depending on the frame rate, uh, excuse me, depending on the resolution that you're using, the frame rate options are going to be restricted. Most of the slow motion capability comes when the camera is set to its 2K or HD modes. So right now in the 4K codec, I'm only able to select up to 30 frames per second. But if we were to change this to 2K or HD full sensor width, the camera can actually record up to 120 frames per second at 422. Uh, if we're willing to select the crop mode down to a 4 thirds and change our subsampling to 420, we're able to get up to 240 frames per second in camera, which is great. That's all right down to the SD cards. You don't need an external recorder. The camera does give us some control over our no noise reduction settings, uh, allowing us to apply it to either of the base ISOs or neither. Uh, so that is kind of a nice feature as some camera manufacturers apply that as sort of their secret sauce and they don't let you adjust it. Uh, I think for most folks, you would generally want to leave it on for anything that you're going to adjust, uh, have slight adjustments in post and leave it off for things that you want more like a raw workflow, more of that uh, sort of decision is going to be made on the editing side. Outside the camera menu, in the record settings menu, we have uh, some basic functions like formatting the media as well as uh, adjusting clip names, but this is also where we change the uh, two slot function. So the camera does have two SD card slots and we can allow them to relay record. We have pre-formatted cards essentially giving us the ability to record uninterrupted for as long as we need, especially helpful in the uh, setup of a live event or something where you don't know how long exactly the entire thing is going to run. Uh, as well as simultaneous record. So if we want to back up to a second card at the same time, we can do that as well. Uh, this is also the menu where we're going to adjust our time code settings. Audio settings are pretty straightforward. Again, as the audio into the camera is a pretty known quantity. So Panasonic's not trying to reinvent the wheel here. They're just trying to give us all the basic tools that we would need, uh, like the ability to do low cut on each channel, as well as apply limiters if we're worried about peaking sound. The output settings, again, somewhat unique in a camera in this price range, allowing us to independently uh, route the SDI, HDMI, and then as they're calling it, the LCD channel, uh, a number of different ways. So this would be where we would change what different indicators and markers uh, we can apply to each of those, uh, as well as uh, how we want to see things like focus assist uh, and exposure controls like zebras and waveform monitors. Going into the file menu on the camera is where we can load custom scene files or save them. So if you are using those scene files to paint your camera uh, and you have to set it up on multiple cameras, worry not. You don't have to take the time to set that up on each one individually. You can copy it to the cards and then port them over. Uh, as well uh, as the setup file, which would allow you to change the user buttons, save them, and then load them again to another camera. Especially useful if you end up renting these as opposed to owning. I hope you guys have enjoyed this uh, nice close look that we've got to have at this exciting new camera, uh, and thank you for joining me. See you on the next video.